If you want to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel, I'd like for you to uh, look at this verse of Scripture in Ezekiel 44, verse 23 and 24. And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane, or the common, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. And in controversy, they shall stand as judges, and they shall judge it according to my ju to my judgments or my ordinances. And they shall keep my laws and my statutes in all mine assemblies, and they shall hallow my Sabbaths. <clears throat> One of the things that God has always required of his people, that is to make a distinction between the holy and the unholy, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean. And if we understand the nature of God, we understand that God, by virtue of his holiness and his cleanness and his rightness and his goodness, stands in contrast to anything that is not clean, right, good, and holy. And so he has given to us the same responsibility that he gave to the priests uh, in the Old Testament and the prophets and to some degree the kings. Whoever was in leadership was to help people to understand the difference. One of the reasons that he had so many laws of those things that were clean and those things were unclean, those things that were good, those things that were bad, uh, in very tangible things was to help people increase their level of discernment between good and bad. <clears throat> the problem in our society is that the, the, the lines between good and bad have been blurred, if not in many cases altogether erased. And it behooves the Christian in the 21st century to establish those lines. What is good? What is bad? What is right? What is wrong? And when we come to a discussion of music, I think that is especially important because there is bad music. And there is good music. And there is music that, yeah, what do you do with it? Is it good? Is it bad? How do we discern? How do we determine? How do we evaluate? And so I'd like to, to approach that subject because one of the things that the, um, the uh, contemporary Christian culture has done is in the area of music, the music itself, take out the words, take out the words, just the noise, the sounds, the, the uh, music itself. They have convinced many, 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 many people <laughs> and many young people that the sound itself, the music itself, is amoral. Now, do you know what I'm, what I'm talking about when I say amoral? That means that it has no morality attached to it. It is neither moral, good, nor immoral, bad. It just is. It just is. And I think that's one of the, one of the things that if we're going to have a discussion about music, we have to answer the question, is music moral? The, the, the music itself, the sounds themselves, or is music amoral? That means no matter how you play it, no matter what you play, no matter what instruments you use, no matter how it is performed or how it comes to us, it is just a combination of, of noise and therefore is neither right or wrong. Now, I don't know where you would come out on this subject, but I'm hoping to share with you what I believe about this subject so that we can do what this verse says, teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane. And tomorrow morning, I want to give you some principles for evaluating music that will help lift this beyond the realm of, 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 of uh, preference to the realm of principle. Uh, because I would like to think that we would not do what my college professor did. 
I mentioned to you that I had a, have a minor in music. I don't know as much about music as some other people like Brother Lyle, but I've dabbled enough into it. And so I, I have a, a minor in music from Grace College in Monona Lake, Indiana. Back in the early 80s, when I was a student there, uh, we had a professor there who was head of the music department. And this was the best that he could do when asked about musical styles. He said, well, he said, he said, well, um, I don't think that the church should be on the cutting edge of anything when it comes to music. So it should not be out there in your face and being offensive. But basically, as he talked to us for one day for about a half hour, 45 minute class period, he basically said, as long as the church is, is behind the world <laughs> and is not on the cutting edge or offending, then basically whatever the world offers after people get accustomed to it, then the church can offer it. And that was in a, in a fairly fundamental Bible-believing Bible uh, college. God, oh, man. Can't we do any better than that? You know? Uh, can't, we, can't we talk about what are the principles and so I have tried to, in the last 30 years, tried to think through some of this thing. What are the principles that make music good or bad? But I start with the presupposition that music is moral. The sounds of those music, the, the, the way it's played, the way it is performed, the way it comes to us, the genre that it comes to us is moral and can be moral and can be immoral. Music speaks a language. Music speaks a language. You see, everything that man touches becomes a moral issue. Uh, one of my early, uh, one of my mentors a number of years ago um, w uh, helped me to see that. That whatever man touches, because man is moral, whatever man touches becomes a moral issue. So therefore, when man touches music, it becomes moral. Let's look at some things that, that we know about music. Um, about the morals and ethics of music. Number one, God is musical. That may surprise you. Uh, I hope not. God is musical. God loves music. He created it. He created it. Psalm 118, verse 14. The Lord is my strength and song. He is my song. It is God that, that has given us the ability to sing, the ability to create, the ability to perform, the ability to enjoy, and the ability to worship. Uh, incidentally, this is probably the hymn, Psalm 118, 14, that Jesus and his disciples sang after the Passover, along with Psalm 136. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Another thing we see in Zephaniah is that God sings. Did you think about God being a singing God? Well, we can imagine Jesus singing. But what about God? Can, can God the Father sing? Revelation 5, 9. And they, no, excuse me. Zephaniah 3, 17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. You know that God loves to sing over his children. If you can imagine God uh, 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 putting us, to, carrying us, uh, rocking us, uh, uh, nurturing us, singing over us. I think mothers, when mothers sing over their children, when they put them to sleep, is a reflection of the character of God. Uh, when Jesus said, I want to be like a, a hen that would draw you to myself and, and, and shelter you with my wings, is a picture of the nurturing God. I think, I think uh, uh, a mother hen, uh, I don't know if hens sing, but mothers sing. Uh, it's part of their nature to sing to their, to their children. So God loves singing. He loves music. In fact, uh, man sings as a reflection of God's nature. And he has made man in his image and gifted him with those gifts as a reflection of his character. Heaven will be filled with singing. They sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy. And of course, you read in the book of Revelation all of the songs that they sang and the focus upon the blood of the Lamb, upon, upon the redemption in Christ. It is part of the heavenly hosts. The heavenlies are filled with music. The Bible says that uh, all the heavenly hosts the stars sang together uh, at the creation. Uh, science has even discovered that uh, the world 
is full of music, is full of sound. They have uh, discovered that the stars sing to each other and sing to God. NASA has discovered a group of massive stars that actually hum to themselves. They have different frequencies and overtones. The universe is not silent. Um, it, is, it is filled with singing. Singing to who? Uh, to God, all creation sings his praises. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day offer speech and night unto night showeth forth knowledge. Uh, so we have the universe filled with singing. Those who study music and astronomy say the universal music, the universe music is identical with the same principles as we have in our music. The same principles exist throughout the whole universe. The whole universe. The heavens are filled with music. Not only the heavenly bodies, but the heavenly beings. We understand that as we compare Scripture with Scripture, that the angels of God sing together. In fact, I won't get into this controversy, but something for you Bible scholars to figure out is, was Lucifer uh, involved in the heavenly, the heavenly uh, worship? Before he was cast out of heaven, there are those uh, who would say he was the, like you had uh, uh, Michael, the warring angel, Gabriel, the, the uh, messenger angel. You had Lucifer, the, um, the, the worship angel. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's interesting that he has a heart for worship and his heart of worship is directed to himself. But could there be, have been something like that? Uh, there, there, like, there likely could have. I was just listening to a preacher yesterday uh, <laughs> who said that uh, he believed that when, devil, when Satan fell out of heaven, he landed in the choir loft. Uh, <laughs> Uh, because so many choirs, and it seems like with, with even now worship teams, where they've displaced the choir with a worship team, so much controversy comes out of the choir. Man's competition to be heard and to be known and to be, to be acknowledged. Uh, I've talked to a lot of chaplains uh, in our prison ministry uh, who have prison choirs, and they would say much of his gr their greatest confrontation or controversy in the church, in the prisons, is from the, mus the musicians. And the, uh, the choir. Um, uh, maybe that's why somebody told me years ago, he said there's the, one of the big problems in the church are preachers that sing and singers that preach. I thought, oh man, that does me a number because I do both. So <laughs> I guess I'll get it on both ends. Uh, music is moral. Music is moral. <clears throat> the argument from other genres would you say that art is moral? Well, there would be those that would say that art is nothing more than lines, circles, and dots. Lines, circles, and dots. Uh, but when you combine those lines, circles, and dots to reflect the heart of the artist, it becomes moral. And so it is more than just a, seri a, a series of, 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 of unarranged lines, but it is a reflection of the heart of the, of the artist. As soon as you begin to arrange those lines and circles and dots, you communicate a message that is either a good message or a bad message. How about speech? Speech, well, speech is an arrangement of sounds and letters. Nothing wrong with sounds and letters. Sounds and letters are neutral. Until you begin to arrange those sounds and letters to express the heart of man. And then when man enters into those sounds and, and, and letters, all of a sudden it takes on a moral, moral connotation. So you have wrong, bad, you have good, right, and then you may have a neutral middle, and I'll describe that in just a minute. Technology. Use the argument of technology. Some can argue that technology is simply the arrangement of electrodes, transistors, diodes, tubes, uh, whatever it is that you use in electronics today. Uh, but those we could say are neither right nor wrong. They're just technology generic. But as soon as man enters into that, and expresses his heart, he expresses either, he uses it for either good or bad, right or wrong. So if that's true for art, speech, and technology, why would it not also be true for music? 
So you could argue that music is just a, uh, the emission of sounds. Uh, when I was in college, we took a course called the science of music, and you look at sound waves, and you look at uh, radio waves, and it's just, uh, it's just waves, it's just, uh, you know, sound waves. But uh, as soon as you put those together and arrange them in an order, and begin to communicate a message that is a reflection of the human heart, it becomes moral. Right, wrong, good, bad. Let me use it, give you an illustration in, in language. You tell me if this is moral, immoral, or neutral. If I were to say, Molly is a talented person, that'd be good or bad. Oh, good, yeah. Molly is a talented person. That's a compliment. What if I said Molly is sitting in a chair? Is that good or bad? It just is. You know, it's just a statement of fact. It's neither, neither wrong nor right. Just Molly sitting in the chair. Now, what if I said Molly is an idiot? <laughs> bad, right? <laughs> Don't be afraid to say it. <laughs> bad. Good, neutral, bad. But as soon as I begin to communicate with Molly, we get into a moral exchange. Now, I want to, I want to share with you something that somebody shared with me a long time ago that helped me in this whole area. Because I was, I was struggling with the concept, okay? I understand good music, bad music. But what about, what do you do with just plain old music, like jingle bells, <laughs> you know, or, or uh, back in the day, uh, Sons of the Pioneers, uh, singing about the Old West, you know. I can't say it's bad. Can't say it's good. What is it? What do you do with it? And so I, uh, I believe it was, um, it was a, a friend of mine who's a minister out in Pennsylvania, Help me to see one time that there are really three kinds of music or places, three, three areas where music comes from. Music comes from either our lower nature, Molly is an idiot, our, um, our, our, our higher nature, our God nature, Molly is a talented person, a child of God, or just a human nature. You realize we have, we have that too. Just plain old human nature. And I never knew what to do with the human nature kind of stuff. And I came to conclude the conclusion that there is room for the human nature to express itself in, in poetry, in music, in um, construction, architecture. That is neither right nor wrong overtly, but becomes right or wrong depending on what you do with it. So while we say uh, there is music that's right and wrong, there's also music that is just music, that is good music, that is good art, that is good technology, that is good architecture. Because God has made the image of man something that is, is, is able to be creative and producing and productive and, 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 and creating things that reflect his beauty and his character and, and, and excellence. So therefore, um, you may take um, now I, I'm, 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 I'm going to go a little heretical on you here. I would give more time to listening to a secular artist that reflects the quality of good music than I would a professing Christian artist that reflects the musical style of a fallen nature. Are you with me? You might have to chew on that for a while. I've been chewing on it for quite a few years. <laughs> so when I came to my children as a father and said, okay, now what kinds of music will we listen to in our home? 
I like Southern gospel. That's what I was raised on. They said, Dad, Southern gospel just doesn't quite cut it for us. <laughs> I said, well, you should have at least some exposure to it. Okay, Dad, we've had that. <laughs> uh, so what, what can we listen to, Dad? And I came to the, to the decision with my children, now be this right or wrong, I'm open to counsel from you. But because of the lower, higher, and human, I said, I would rather have you listen to some good music from secular artists that are not offensive or that are not sinful than to have you listen to, quote, Christian artists that reflect the music of the world from a fallen nature. So think about that. Music is communication. It communicates a message. There are some things that can be sung about, written about. Uh, poems can be written that reflect our common experience as people, trying to make the best in, a world that we, in the world that we live in and reflect beauty. But then there is, we have to acknowledge that there is a line where music becomes sinful. It can be used for control. Music touches the emotions. It touches the emotions. It can be used to manipulate. Do you realize that music can be used to manipulate? Studies used to be done. I'm not sure that they do much of this, this anymore, but, but um, uh, how music uh, affects consumers. And so there was a, there was a company called Muzak, back in the uh, 60s and 70s, Muzak, that uh, developed elevator music. Have you heard the term elevator music? That's what they used to play in elevators and grocery stores and uh, uh, to try to create a mood. Uh, and advertisers, advertisers spend an incredible amount of money trying to create moods to manipulate people. Do you think that, do you think that, uh, that um, the world tries to manipulate Christians through music? I think it does. I think it does. Tends to, some music tends to make you slow down, browse longer. Uh, some music will tend to make you speed up, move through the line faster. Television commercials, um, television uh, movie scores, all built, music all built around trying to manipulate and to bring forth some sort of, uh, of response. I remember as a young man when I first became aware of some of the power of music, we were at the Bible camp, and they showed us a, a, a film. Uh, uh, back then, it was 16 millimeter films that you could show uh, if you wanted to pay the money for it on special occasions. Now you stop, plug in the DVD. But um, anyway, uh, it was on music, and it was on uh, media. And uh, it started with this eerie music and dark, um, shadow, shadowy figures walking through a graveyard. And... Uh, Oh man, you're about sitting there on the edge of your seat, you know, this is spooky, you know. And uh, then all of a sudden, as you're just about ready to freak out and know that something is going to jump out from behind the tombstone and grab you, uh, the music stopped. <clears throat> and they stopped and said, now we're going to play a different kind of music to this same scene. And they had this scene, same tomb, gravestone, graveyard, uh, same shadowy figures, same darkness, but they played marching music instead. Totally different effect. <laughs> Totally different effect. <laughs> uh, music does something to people. It touches, it communicates, and it brings forth, it's designed to bring forth a response. And how do we evaluate all that? Time Magazine said this, music can be a tool for relaxation, for stimulation, for communication, and for revolution. In fact, it is often a rhythm of resistance against parents, against police, and against power. Hitler knew this, and he changed the music of the German youth and developed the German youth culture around the, the music, which was intended to elicit a nationalistic, um, uh, militaristic response. And the young people went to their death uh, being manipulated by Hitler's music. The communists in communist Soviet Union, uh, same thing under Stalin, Lenin. 
Get a hold of the, of, the, of the music of the people and you can literally lead them to their deaths. Americans did it too. American Revolution. Yankee Doodle Dandy. Stick a feather in your cap and call it macaroni. You know, let's go out, let's, let's, let's get the enemy, you know. So it's just to elicit some kind of a response. By the way, uh, music also can be used to teach false doctrine. Was it Arius back in the, what, third, fourth century, who put his false doctrine, his false Christology into music and taught it to the common people? And the common people ran, walked around and through their work singing the, these songs that Arius taught them that Jesus Christ is not God, uh, the divine uh, reflection of God. Rather, he is a man who became God or whatever. Athanasius then not only had to deal with their theology, but he had to deal with their music because they were singing and believing and promoting a false gospel um, through their music. <clears throat> Advertisers spend billions on images and music to move us. They recognize that there is a correlation between branding and music and product recognition. Someone has said music bypasses your mind and goes directly to your heart. You can look in the areas of music and therapy, music and memory. Music can re resurrect memories. Smell can resurrect memories. Uh, some people who have been traumatized, when they smell a particular smell that was present when the trauma happened, it will take them back in their memories. Uh, even today, if, when I hear a particular song, <laughs> I can tell you exactly where I was and the setting that I was in when that song first ministered to me. It is powerful stuff, this thing of music. It can be used for good. It can be used for bad. Why? Now let me ask you this. Why do all the experts agree that music is a powerful tool of communication? The actual music itself. And yet the church glibly says, oh, it's all moral. There's no such thing as bad music. When even the world itself recognizes that music can be used for good or bad, the actual tones as it reflects the heart and tries to elicit a response, is moral. <clears throat> this book was written, Why Johnny Can't Sing Hymns. The writer of that book, his observation was that it's not about old and new, it's about good and bad. One of the things that, uh, that we as, as preachers sometimes get accused of is that, well, you just think that everything new is bad and everything old is good. Wrong. Uh, there's plenty of old that's bad, and there's a fair amount of new that's good. So we're not talking about good or bad or old or new. We're talking about good and bad. We're talking about the principles that reflect the old or the, the, the good and bad rather than just the time frame. The time frame. In fact, I have to, uh, <laughs> I have to give this younger generation a, a bit of slack uh, because uh, in, their, in their singing of, of worship choruses and so on, because your worship choruses have, uh, I shouldn't say your, this generation's worship choruses have uh, a fair bit more content to it than some of my generation's worship choruses. I mean, Michael, row your boat ashore, hallelujah, hallelujah, what does that mean? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. Well, it means come by here, but how many times do you have to sing that in order to get the message across? You know? So my generation's worship music wasn't anything to brag about. So old doesn't mean good, and new doesn't mean bad, but neither does old mean bad, and new mean good. You see, so we can't fall into that trap either. Well, this is more than 50 years old. This is more than 20 years old. So we, we don't want to sing that. That's, that's old fashioned. No, there's something, there's something stable about some of the old music. There's something creative about some of the new music. If it fits within the parameters and the principles that I'll tell you about tomorrow morning. <clears throat> the question that really needs to be, be, to be being asked is how does the church make the decision of what is good and bad music? 
This is what uh, uh, that book um, referred to, why Johnny can't sing hymns. The writer said this, the Reformation also changed worship music, and it did. And we have to acknowledge that, that there were, it was a shift in church music during the time of the Reformation. But only after two and a half centuries of theological discussion. You see, that's the kicker right there. That we make change in worship genres after an intense look at Scripture and theology and the nature of God and the nature of what we're changing to. It hasn't been, this writer goes on to say, it hasn't been the same with modern changes. The debate came about ex post facto. In other words, after the fact. So we change, and then instead of really evaluating it, we just tried to find reason to justify the change. See, that's the difference. <clears throat> you're talking change in musical styles, you're talking change in musical genres, then let's spend two and a half centuries a theological study on it and see where we get. No, we got to do it now and then we'll try to figure it out. Not a, not a good way to go. Dan Lucarini said this. He said he left the contemporary Christian music movement because the music changes in churches were bringing about in, in contemporary Christian music into the churches because we like it. Basically, it was what Lucarini says. Lucarini said this in his book on page 90. Is the rock music style used in so much contemporary Christian music associated with any particular moral dimension? The awe moralists will say it's not a moral issue. This is what uh, Lucarini says. I argue that it is clearly and unequivocally associated with immorality, that is the rock music, especially promiscuous and adulterous sex, glorification of drugs, and rebellion against authority. Remember, music creates a response. And certain types of music will create a godly response, and other types of music create a fleshly response. No, I mean the music style itself. Decades of rock music in our culture have permanently stamped that musical style with the dimension of immorality. Changing the lyrics and substituting Christian musicians cannot remove that stigma. And Lucarini coming out of that genre said, hey, the music itself is a problem, is sinful. The problem we've had is with the whole seeker sensitive approach to church growth is rather than going to the scripture and saying, what does God's word say about music and how can we glorify God in, what we, in how we worship him? The seeker sensitive churches promoted this. You go to a community and you go around to the people in the community and ask them what they would like to have in church. Now, wait a minute. There's something wrong with this picture. Church has always been about God telling us how to worship. Now, we're going to the world and saying, you tell us how to worship. Oh, you want the big band music? All right, no problem. We'll give you big band music. Just come to church. Oh, you want jazz? Uh, sure, no problem. You, you come on in. Come to church. We'll give you jazz. You want less formality? Okay, we'll, we'll get rid of the pulpit and we'll sit down on a chair and we'll just have a dialogue and tell stories. Just come, come, come. Rather than saying, God, what, what, what is church about from you, from your word? What do you say about church? What do you say about worship? What do you say about preaching? What do you say about the public declaration of Scripture? And because of that whole movement, <clears throat> one of the newspapers, I think it may have been the New York Times, made this statement. Just the time that the world needs the church, the church has become just like us. So what do you need the church for? I can have my tunes and I don't have to give in the offering. <laughs> oh, offering a problem? We won't, get, we won't take offerings anymore. We just want you to feel at home. Church is not a place where sinners feel at home. Church is a place where saints worship. Amen? The biggest lie 
is that music is all moral. This has paved the way for every Christ musical genre to be accepted by Christians without question. Peter Wicke, rock music, culture, aesthetics, and sociology said this, we respond to the materiality of rock's sounds. And the rock experience is essentially erotic. <laughs> Alan Bloom from the University of Chicago. Rock is all there is. The words make little difference. They may be explicitly sexual or even religious. It is all eroticism. Music sociologist experts say that musical style, philosophy, and theology are all interrelated. Someone who wrote The Sounds of Social Change said a, mu a message can be carried entirely in the non-lyrical elements of music. <clears throat> Jazz, for example, communicates the message of relativism, relativism with its slurring vocal and instruments and its unstructured meter and rhythm. is a reflection of a social movement that was about unstructured, um, Un, undisciplined, unrefined, or not unrefined, but of, of un, unrestricted uh, movement, music. Martin Williams, the jazz expert, said this, jazz knows no absolutes. Interesting. It's the way many of them have lived their lives. Wayne Barlow, a secular writer, jazz, while it is here to stay, has no place in worship. <laughs> it's interesting what some of the world has to say about what the church has adopted. Esquire magazine said this about disco. Okay. <clears throat> New age mu music. Um, we, may, we may, and you may hear people talk about the dangers of rock music, but new age music also has a lot of dangers involved in it. Especially when you realize that, that many of the new age artists r believe that their music uh, is the avenue by which the spirits come and, um, and make themselves known. The short, repeated motifs, it reflects a, a, a worldview. And I don't, I don't claim to understand all these things. I just know that there's something there. The repetitious patterns, the lack of variety, uh, communicates that the world is, is constant. It's not, uh, it's not moving towards a climax and a finish like the Christian worldview, but it is repetitive and cyclical and it is flat and, and uh, uh, without, without movement, uh, with no, no, no movement, no room for God. Uh, ideas are sustained without change. There's little or no sense or form, a form or rules. The concept behind it is that there is no reality, good or evil, right or wrong. There is no sin. There is just presence. Uh, they also believe and communicate that we are all divine. So there's no highs and lows. It's just, it's just present. No difference between religions. Um, New Age composers. See, musical style reflects a school of thought. And that's probably where most of us don't really understand the schools of thought behind the music. Let me give you an example. I'll, I'll just do an analogy here. Um, people talk about gateways into um, the occult. Gateways into the occult. Um, there's a lot of discussion, has been and probably still is, a lot of discussion on New Age medicine. New Age medicine. So what danger is there in New Age medicines? What danger is there in, say, homeopathic medicines? Uh, is there any? Well, I don't pretend to know all those answers, but there may be not, it just if you're talking about putting some serum under your tongue and um, assuming that it absorbs into your body and, and cures you of whatever ails you. That may not be such a big deal, but what becomes a big deal is because Many homeopathic and New Age medicines are actually viewed by the New Age movement itself as a gateway to pull people in. Just like the occult, there are certain lesser forms of the occult, maybe like uh, uh, your horoscope. 
you know? Um, what's with a horoscope? What's wrong with reading a horoscope? Probably made up anyway. Probably somebody just sitting in their, in their office generating ideas. You know, well, let's, let's sell them this today. Let's, let's promote this. Or, I don't know where it all comes from, but I do know it can be a gateway into demonism. So you desensitize yourself, and it paves the way to more and more exposure to the occult. Just like New Age medicine paves the way to more and more exposure into the New Age movement. That's what it's designed to do. It's designed to look harmless, sound harmless, taste harmless, but it introduces you, desensitizes you, and then pulls you in. I would submit to you that the same thing happens with music. And it can happen with New Age move music with no beat. If we're not careful, if we don't understand, the musical style is a reflection of a school of thought. By embracing the style, here's what you need to get. By embracing the style, one opens the door to that ideology and breaks down the resistance that a Christian naturally has towards things that are wrong. <clears throat> I'll give you the bottom line as I see it. Music is moral. It is not just a matter of opinion. It is not just a matter of preference. There is music that reflects the higher nature there is music that reflects the human nature. That may be that middle that we don't quite know what to do with. But then there is music that reflects the lower nature. That is, to, is designed to elicit a response that reflects the sinful nature of man. And I would argue that rock music by its very nature is that. Number two, no generation has ever believed this lie before. And what lie am I talking about? I'm talking about the lie that music is not moral. That it is all moral. This is probably the first generation in Western culture anyway, in, in church history, that has, has believed that lie. Most generations have seen a clear-cut distinction. This is the philosophy coming out of contemporary Christian music, the rock music genre, and the compromising church growth movement. So we gotta, we gotta become like the world to win the world. I hope you see a problem with that biblically. Number four, to say music is all moral is to say that there is no such thing as good music or bad music. And if you say there's no such thing as good music or bad music, it is also to say that God doesn't care what kind of music we use. Because none of it's good or none of it's bad in and of itself. If music is all moral, then there is no line and anything goes. And incidentally, it is interesting to me that that's the way that many evangelicals are living their lives. Claiming to be a Christian and yet saying, I can be a Christian and have no right or wrong and no lines, anything goes and the music has actually desensitized us to, uh, to the theology behind it. Number seven, our powers of discernment have become weakened. <clears throat> so we come back to this verse. To teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane. And cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. And in controversy, they shall stand in judgment, and they shall judge it according to my judgments. Let me just <clears throat> close with this thought. Do you remember the Old Testament account when the Ark of the Covenant had been captured by the Philistines? The Philistines had all kinds of things going on as Dagon, their god, fell on his face and broke his head, his neck, and his arms and legs and prostrated himself before the Ark of the Covenant. They got scared and spooked, and they said, we're getting rid of this Ark, and they sent it back. 
<clears throat> and you recall what happened. David come along with his, with his, his uh, workers, the priests and so on. They got all excited. The ark is coming. The ark is coming. And what did they do? Um, well, of course, um, they put it on a cart. And I may be getting my stories mixed up here just a bit. It's been a little bit since I, since I read the account. Forgive me. Um, but at any rate, they put it on a cart, and Uzzah, no, it wasn't Uzzah. What was the, what was the guy's Lester? Huh? Uzzah. <clears throat> Reached out his hand to steady the ark, and God smote him on the spot. Now, his motives were probably clear, probably, I mean, I don't want to see the ark of God fall, so I have to somehow help God out. Uh, we can't afford to lose this ark. I mean, what if it comes crashing down? And, and all those things that may have been going through their minds. But the bottom line was they were transporting the ark in a way that God had not prescribed. In fact, God had prescribed the way that the ark was to be transported. It was to be transported, being wrapped and covered with the, uh, the skins, it was to be transported by the priests. There was a very specific way that it was to be transported, a very specific way that God was to be worshipped. And uh, they chose, for whatever reasons, to bypass God's standard and go with their own thoughts and feelings and, made a dis and, and just destroyed it. And, and I'd like to think that and suggest to you that that is similar to what's going on in many people's worship. Their desires are to please God, but then they have that self-desire, and their motives may be somewhat pure, but they've really not come to God's word and say, God, how do you want to be worshiped? And then gone with that. So I encourage you to do that. And tomorrow morning, Lord willing, we'll give you some ideas on how to discern between the good and the bad, the right and the wrong. All right, thank you very much.